drive you backwards or propel you forwards, but you'll never move forward unless you pick up your foot. through an Old Testament passage of scripture in 1 Kings chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, you go ahead and turn there. You'll also see it on the screen here. For those of you who are in the front, you might not be able to see past my big head, and uh, that's okay. We'll do our best. Um, Solomon in this passage of scripture is getting ready to dedicate the temple, this magnificent temple that he spent the last seven years building. And it's these words in First Kings chapter 8 of this dedication speech that I think are so powerful, something that we need to hear today as we're gathered together under one roof. And so I want to read to you First Kings chapter 8, starting at verse 13. It says this, then Solomon said, I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Exalted. How exalted, you might ask. Any football fans out here? Just raise your hand. Any cowboy fans? Cowboy fan, ah, not too many cowboy fans. This is the comparison I always think about when I think of Solomon's temple because the temple reflected Solomon's wealth. You gotta understand this. A few years ago when the cowboy stadium was built, this thing cost, if we have a picture of it, this thing cost $1 billion to build. What is that? I don't know. Well, I haven't had a billion dollars in a while. But I think it's a lot of money, right? I looked it up. This little screen here that's, I think, uh, really, really long, really big, $40 million, just the screen alone. And just as this stadium reflects Jerry Jones's wealth, the temple that we're going to read about reflected Solomon's wealth. You're talking, it took 150,000 people, seven years to build. It was overlaid with four tons, 4,000 tons of gold. And today's Modern economy, this would have been the equivalent of not $1 billion, but $160 trillion, some people say. Yeah, everybody go, if you can whistle. It's a lot of money. This is an impressive house for the Lord. Then it says this in verse 14. Stop whistling. Uh, <laughs> verse 14 says, And the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. I thought about having you guys stand for the entire sermon. Did you guys like that? You know, some of you know how long I go sometimes. This would have been millions of people, though. Imagine this scene, millions of people standing for this, these words. And then it says this in verse 15, and he said these words, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised. I love that phrase. They said, blessed be the Lord who has fulfilled his promise. In other words, what's happening here is they were worshiping in response to what he had done. They're worshiping as a result of promises fulfilled. You know, when we gather on Sunday mornings, when we gather here today, we're, that's all we're doing. We're worshiping in response to promises fulfilled. And if God has been faithful to you and has been faithful to our church, can you say amen? amen. He's been so faithful. So we worship, blessed be the Lord. He says, saying, since the day, verse 16, that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my, my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel in which to build a house. I'm sorry, uh, my people Israel. Verse 17, now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled the promise that he made for I have risen in the place of David, my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. 
and I have built the house for the name of the Lord. Why do you build the house? For the name of the Lord. I think that's really important to remember. It reminds me of the verse that says, unless the workers, or unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. God's the one that builds his church. We're just the vessels that he's chosen to use. Isn't that amazing? I think I look at you guys out here and I think of my own abilities, I think of our own abilities as a church. And they're down here compared to what God has done in our church. It doesn't add up, but with God, he builds his church. And so whatever you give, whenever you serve, whenever you sacrifice, whenever you share, whenever you volunteer and change a poopy diaper in the nursery, it's all for the name of the Lord. And as God blesses our church, as God blesses this congregation and we continue to grow, we must not forget whose glory and whose name it's for, right? But imagine this scene. Solomon stands before millions of people. You imagine what that would have been like. I mean, today we're, we're gathered maybe 400, 450 here today across four campuses. This would have been millions of people, 12 tribes, all celebrating the goodness of God and how he's been so faithful to them. Seven long years. Imagine that sense of accomplishment of what that felt like. Um, a couple years ago, remember when we met at Good Times in Olean, um, we had the opportunity to watch that, that documentary, Ripples of Grace. And I, I just sat back with all of you, that, that service, for those of you who were there, and, and just in awe as I watched that story unfold through 26 different people telling one story and how God's grace weaved it all together through Ripples of Grace. And that was, it was after seven years. I had been at the church seven years. I'd taken a sabbatical. I was able to have a little bit of time to, to make that video. And I, I, I just can't imagine what this would have been like. After seven long, tireless years of blood, sweat, and tears, they finally have this building. They finally have this temple completed. The sense of awe must have been overwhelming to them. And so Solomon is up in front of the congregation, and in this epic speech, he's declaring the faithfulness of God, and he says these words in verse 27. We'll keep reading. It says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house? He knows in his head, not even the universe can contain God's glory. And he's looking at this house, which happens to be one of the wonders of the world. He's like, not even that, not even that can contain your glory, O God. What are we to do with this? He says in verse 28, yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord, my God listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day towards this house. Wouldn't that be a great vision statement for our church? Wouldn't that be a great prayer request for our church that, that the eyes of the Lord, if we can go to the actual verse here, where is this verse? Verse 30? What verse is it? Next, sli next slide. Next slide, Jordan. Did it get frozen? Maybe I, maybe I missed it. Whatever. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? To, for our prayers at church, that the eyes of the Lord will be always on this place, night and day. If anything else, that's what I want. That's what we want for our church, right? And then he says this. Notice if you, you, you pick up on a theme. The place of which you have said, my name shall be there. And you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place and listen to the plea of your servant of your people Israel when they pray towards this place and listen, verse 30, in heaven in your dwelling place and you, when you hear, forgive. Do you notice a theme there? The theme is listen. More specifically, God is listening to his people. And Solomon, during this dedication speech, wants the people and wants us to realize that when we treat God's temple, when we treat the church for the purpose that it was intended for, God will always fulfill his promise. He will listen to our prayers. But if the temple, in, his, in this case, ever became about anything else, it would be to their own detriment. For those of you who know the story of Israel, it did become about other things, didn't it? Namely, idols. And it was almost like it was Solomon's fault because he married all these foreign women, which is crazy. The, the, the wisest man to ever walk this, this earth had all those wives. Not a good idea, guys, right? How, how could the wisest guy be so stupid in that moment? And his failure to protect that and to introduce all these foreign women also introduced all these foreign gods. And as a result, Israel wandered. 
If you know the story of Israel, after Solomon's kingdom, the kingdom of Israel was split into two. There's 10 northern tribes of Israel. They were exiled to Assyria, conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC. There's two northern tribes of Judah. They were exiled into Babylon in 586 BC. The temple was destroyed. God's people were dispersed. And yet God's grace still rested on those people. And years later, God brought them back from exile. There's another There's another temple that was built. It was known as Herod's temple, but it really didn't matter which temple was there. The hearts of the people were still never completely for God. In fact, years later, Jesus comes into that very temple and he sees the temple not being used for its intended purpose. So what does he do? He goes, Indiana Jones on everybody. Kids, draw a picture of Indiana Jones. And he... He flips the table, he cracks the whip, and he says this statement, the statement that you probably know, but it points all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 8. Look what it says in Luke 19. This is the triumphant entry. This is where Jesus walks into the temple. He entered the temple and began to drive out all those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house. Everybody say, my house. house. This is the purpose. It should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Just like Solomon before him, Jesus is pointing to the purpose of the temple. Jesus is pointing to the purpose of the church, and that is it was supposed to be a place of prayer. More specifically, one of the purposes of the temple was so that it would be a refuge for all those idols that were plaguing the land that people could go to and find refuge. And if they kept the purpose for what it was intended, God would always listen to them. But there's a second purpose. I think this is so cool to notice. It's in uh, verse 41. Look what it says. It says, likewise, when a foreigner, in other words, an unbeliever, someone who is not in the family of God, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, look at this, for they shall hear of your great name. How do they hear of his great name? It says it right here. And your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. In other words, because of all the things that he's done, people are starting to get ear of this great God. They're starting to be intrigued by this great name. And then it says this, when he comes and prays, this foreigner, when he comes and prays towards this house, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you. That's a bold prayer by Solomon. In order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, and do your people Israel, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I've built is called by your name. See, what's happening here, the foreigner was supposed to hear about this prayer answering God, and as a result, come and experience this prayer answering God as well. I think the same is true today. The most powerful witness that we have in the church towards people who aren't in the church foreigners, unbelievers, is simply sharing how faithful God has been, how strong his arms have been in your life, how merciful he's been in your life, how faithful he's been to you. And through your story, they'll lean in and listen and say, I want to know about that great name. It's one of the purposes of the temple, that it wasn't supposed to be just a refuge for the people that are inside of it. It was supposed to be a vehicle of salvation for the people that were outside of it. That's us. That's us. I got a great story to share. Why don't you guys come up? These microphones on. I've asked uh, Nate Siebert and Tim Taylor, our campus pastor in Olean. Nate is from Olean, or I'm sorry, you're not Olean, you're Shingle House. Nate, come on over here, guys. So a couple weeks ago at prayer meeting, Tim told us about, okay, Tim told us about a, um, a guy in Shingle House, and uh, I mean, it was really, really powerful the way he said, I want to uh, make sure Nate tells this story too, but this was the guy he was telling us about. And um, so when I heard it, I was just like, you, got, you guys got to share your story. Nate was more than gracious to, uh, to do this. So I'm going to kind of interview them, kind of pull out the story. Um, Nate, go ahead and introduce yourself. I already told them your name, but tell them about what your life was like before Christ how you um, started coming to the church and how you met Christ? Well, from the beginning, I was born in 1959. 
I didn't really have a dad when I grew up. He was mean. He uh, beat up my mom a lot. Twelve, at age 12, he came home and uh, he uh, said, put nude on my lap. He said, you play baseball? And I said, yes, I do. He said, I'm going to be here tomorrow. Watch you play a game. Yeah, that's my dad. He lies. He ain't any good. Well, 2 o'clock in the morning, my brother comes up. He says, your dad just died. Mm. Downstairs. That's where it all began. And Nate, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I just happen to have 12 brothers. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. That even gets better. I have 12 sisters. <laughs> I have 24 brothers and sisters. Yeah. Pretty One amazing. Mom, a beautiful lady that I remember this weekend. And then uh, a few years ago, right, you... you came to the church. How did you come to the church, the Shingle House Alliance Church? Well, I just, I was sick. I had Parkinson's, I had diabetes, and I was an alcoholic. My dad was, so I guess I could be too. So I went to church, I sat there in the corner all by myself. A good friend came up and grabbed me and says, come on, we went up front. We prayed, and uh, that's when I first started. You gave your life to Christ. What difference did Christ make in your life after oh, that? Lord. It's amazing what he's done for me. Uh, there's words that can't be spoken. There's, he's done so much in my life. He, I don't know. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. So this was about three years ago. Yes. The church was struggling still. Um, there came a point in time where... Oh, yeah. There, we only had seven in there. Yeah. And, well, I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't want this. I didn't want the pain. I didn't want, I didn't want any of this up here. Not in Shingle House. No. But there's seven of us. And, and I remember meeting Nate when we went through the whole, you know, initial process of getting to know you guys. We shared our idea. We shared what uh, Arcade was. I think some of the leaders in Arcade actually came to that meeting just to kind of tell their story. It wasn't too receptive. Um, we weren't really sure whether or not they were going to go for it. We, uh, I think I was in Olean, uh, maybe hearing Pastor Andy preach one time when he was preaching over there, there in Olean during the summer last year. And we asked them to come to the Wellsville campus to watch the video, just to kind of check things out, and then meet with our leadership team downstairs in the Fellowship Hall just for lunch and ask any questions. This is where the story, I think, gets interesting. So Tim told me, Last summer, um, I said, after I got back from Olean, how'd it go? He's like, well, yeah, it's pretty good, but he doesn't tell me all the details, so I got to pull it out of him a lot of times. So I said, well, no, really, how'd it go? And he said, well, pretty good, except for there was this one guy who th threw his um, keys on the table and stormed out, and uh, not sure if they're going to go for this or not. I was like, oh, that's not good. So go ahead and tell me what you were, you were saying at staff meeting. Because I never connected the two. Yeah, uh, so basically I just reminded them at staff meeting, you know, kind of who Nate was, because I, I don't know that everybody knew who Nate was, but that, that meal downstairs after the service, Nate was the guy that kind of threw his keys in frustration and, and then got up and left. And as he was leaving, um, I, I just felt like I needed to go talk to him. So I got up and went outside and we talked for a minute and I, I knew Nate was struggling. I know that these transitions aren't, it's not an easy thing. Um, and, and he was struggling with that. I think that a lot of people were. And I, you know, I just told him, you know, I'll be praying for you. And I, and I told him, I know it seems like it's a hostile takeover, um, but, but this is a good thing. We want to come in and see the church grow. And, and he, he still left. And I stood outside for a second when he left. And, and I just remember, like, I felt like God was wanting me to pray for him. And so I, I just stood right there for a minute before I went back inside and, and I prayed for Nate. And I don't remember everything that I, that I prayed, but I know that uh, a consistent prayer that I prayed throughout this whole process, even before like it was a realistic possibility, like I would stop on Tuesday nights at, that, at the church in Shingle House in the parking lot and pray. Because I was coming home from worship practice and I'd stop in the parking lot and I would pray. And actually I prayed every day on the way to work, to Wellsville, and from work. I prayed every day, God, let this be of you. Let this not be of us or our leaders or the people of Shingle House. Let this be of you. And, and it was a very similar prayer that I, that I prayed when, when Nate left. 
Um, certainly praying for Nate and the struggles because his struggle was the same as a lot of the other people um, who are part of the remnant uh, or were part of the remnant. The, the struggle, was, it was tough to make yeah. this, this change. And I think the, the unsurety of, of what this was to look like after, after it happened. Yeah. So. so then you told us, or you, you, you told us, or maybe I'll just tell the story, that Nate, as he just sit, shared, he has Parkinson's disease. And, um, but you were saying that you, you're constantly seeing him mow the lawn, right? And do things behind the, uh, the scenes of the church. Well, actually, Nate and I had a conversation last week, two weeks ago. He, he stopped and mowed, and then he stopped in the church, and we talked for a little while. And he was just saying how much God has been doing for him, how awesome it is to see, you know, our church. And he's really digging in, and he's like, you can't get me to leave this place. And, like, I, honestly, I started to choke up a little bit there, but I told Nate, I was like, man, what an awesome thing from the moment, looking back, um, when you threw your keys on the table in frustration to now. Yeah. And I said, you know, if you think about it, there were some of the people that were from the remnant who were, I'm sure at one point, because Nate's still kind of a young Christian, you've been saved for, what, two, three years, right? Two, three years. Um, I'm assuming that some of the remnant were trying to get Nate to hang on, trying to get him to stay, come to church, and get connected mm. to them, and stay in the Word. And to, <laughs> and to see Nate, a young Christian, filling the role now for those people, it, man, it just was like, it, it punched me, and it, man, it made me choke up, because... He's setting an example as a young Christian, and Scripture tells us to set an example, and he was doing just that. And I thought, what an awesome thing to see that just a few years ago you were here, and now you're the one that, that's trying to get Amen. the people to hang on. And I just thought it was an awesome example. Amen. Thank you, guys. Awesome story. God can use anyone. Amen? Amen. Anyone. Appreciate you guys. You know, uh, what's so interesting about the place where Jesus overturned the tables and, and drove out those money changers, you know what that place was called? It's called the, the Court of the Gentiles, meaning that was the place where foreigners were supposed to be able to come in, hear about this great God, and come experience. And Jesus says, you, you totally botched it. You totally missed the point. You're turning this into a place where you're going to make money for yourselves. Something's got to change here. So he, he gets mad. He, he flips the table. And then, rather than offering, this is so important to understand the story, rather than offering an animal sacrifice, which, if you know the story of Solomon's dedication here, 142,000 animals were sacrificed. Kids, draw that. Um, 142,000 animals. Rather than offering all those animals as a sacrifice of peace, Jesus himself offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice and, and accomplishes what no temple, no, what, no animal sacrifice could ever accomplish, and that was change the human heart so that we wouldn't pursue idols, we would pursue God. And he said, whoever will come, whoever's going to come and believe and pray, will find healing and salvation in my name. So here's the application that I want you to remember. Just as Solomon's temple was supposed to be a refuge for the weak, a refuge for insiders, and a vehicle of salvation for outsiders, we, the temple of the Holy Spirit, this church, needs to be a refuge for the weak and a light to the lost, period. And here's the key. The only way that happens, the primary way that happens, is through prayer. God can do what we can't do. God knows how to fill in all those gaps and accomplish what we have no ability to accomplish. God knows how to tug on people's hearts that you've been praying for and actually get them to church and actually see a guy who was an alcoholic a few years ago come to the altar and be saved and experience God's grace, and now being a part of a church that does that for others. We're to be a refuge for the weak and a light to the lost. And the only way that's going to happen is through prayer. And when our focus is on that, no one's going to stop it. But when it becomes about anything else, that's where the church fails. We can't do that. We can't, 
We can't miss this. I love the quote by Andrew Murray. Don't, don't miss this. He says this, the man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelization in history. I like that quote. We can't ever underestimate the power of prayer. I think prayer is the reason why Aaron and I are here. I think prayer is the reason why Pastor Andy and Alyssa came on board. I think prayer is the reason why Stu quit his job as a nurse to come on board. I think prayer is the reason why Pastor Andy walked into Subway and talked to Pastor John and and that all came about. There's all these backstories of how God brought leadership here. God brought people here. God brought your family here. But the one thread that ties it all together is prayer. May we never become a church that forgets that. One of the reasons why we're here is because a few years ago, 1002, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, send out the workers into the harvest field and watch the Lord of the harvest work. And he has because of simple prayers just like that. I think if we want to be a church that reaches our community for Christ, Prayer has to be the fuel that keeps the fire burning. Otherwise, we'll become so complacent. We'll be some co- so content with our own churches. Congratulations, you've got you know, two services now in Shingle House. But I loved what Tim prayed the other week. He says, what would it look like if we had five services in Shingle House? In a matter of six weeks, there's 140 people there. How does that happen? God, Amen. This, this wasn't in my notes, but there's something that needs to be said. The reason why God is moving so much in your, your campus is because you have a team of people that are really fired up, right? And I remember my first two years in Wellsville, we were fired up, and then someone said, well, you, you're about to hit the honeymoon stage. The honeymoon stage is over. And they were right, because there's something happens that after two years, same thing, same thing with every church, that that fire begins to die out. It can't can't die out. We'll become like a lot of dying churches that have lost that first passion, that first love of seeing a refuge for the weak and a light to the lost. Prayer needs to be about that. And one of the ways that it happens is just what Solomon did in 1 Kings chapter 8, where in response to promises fulfilled, they said these words, blessed be the Lord. They worshiped. So I thought that's how we'd end our worship services, just by having a time of praise and prayer. We're going to sing a, a song. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. They're going to kind of play some background music, but um, one, one word that really struck me is in verse 23, if you can put that, that verse up on the screen there, Jordan, where Solomon says these words at the beginning of his speech. He says, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven, above or on earth beneath. And look what he says, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. That, that phrase, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love, echoes what Solomon's dad, David, said in the Psalms. Psalm 136, verse 1 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That's what David said. If you get a chance, read through all of Psalm 136. Because there's a pattern over and over again. The psalmist says, this is what God's done. And then it says, for the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever.